This episode of Paradigm Profiles is about Toonerville and the gang's leader, Timothy Joseph McGee. Toonerville Reefa 13 is a Sureño street gang located in the neighborhood of Atwater Village, a lower middle class area of Los Angeles consisting of 1.78 square miles just north of downtown Los Angeles along Interstate 5 adjacent to Glendale, California. Even the entrance to the California Adventure theme park 100 mile per hour park at Disneyland was modeled after quaint Atwater Village of the 1940s. But a Mexican street gang known as Toonerville, also known as Toonerville Reefa 13 aka TBR, established roots in the area as early as 1942. As gang activity flourished in Los Angeles in the late 1970s and 1980s, clashes between Toonerville and various rivals, most frequently the Rascals 13 TRS, brought drastic change to the neighborhood. The once dominant Toonerville gang's territory shrunk by more than 50% as the Rascals established themselves in the area of Atwater Village, south of Los, Los Feliz Boulevard. The Rascals 13 is a predominantly Hispanic street gang that established themselves in the late 1970s, which was originally formed by a group of Atwater youths in order to protect themselves from the older, well-established gangs, primarily Toonerville Reefa TVR, the Avenues, Avs, and Frogtown Reefa FTR. Though smaller in number, the Rascals are just as equally vicious as their older arch nemesis. The crime rate increased in the area, the economy wavered, and ethnic diversity grew. Nearly half of the residents are immigrants from foreign countries, and over half of the 5,000 households earn less than $40,000 annually. There is, however, a modern movement to revitalize the area into its once middle-class status. The organization claims the area north of Los Feliz Boulevard between San Fernando Road and the Los Angeles River as its territory and has expanded into at least three other suburbs of Los Angeles. At some point in the 1990s, Timothy Joseph McGee, a.k.a. Weddle, became the gang's leader or shot caller, demanding absolute loyalty from nearly 200 members, training his legion in calisthenics, target practice, tactics to elude police, and procedures to eliminate rival gang members. Toonerville Reefa 13 members were typically posted, armed with weapons, on three main roads that led into their turf with cell phones or walkie-talkies for communication. This is reminiscent to how Acorn Village in Oakland used to operate in those projects. The entrance had residents of Acorn Village posted in a number of different locations, all vantage points that would see any presence of law enforcement long before they had any chance of entering the projects and encountering those who were holding the drugs. The Toonerville's gang main source of income was the drug trade, in which members and associates would deal drugs consisting primarily of cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, marijuana, and PCP. These drugs were dealt out of numerous trap houses operating within the gang's zone of control, and Toonerville demanded complete control over the zoned out territory that they considered theirs by controlling the prices, eliminating competition, and extorting some of the mom and pop businesses in their neighborhood. Weddle controlled the Toonerville gang as if they were in essence a small army and that their survival depended not only on his ability to lead, but also his knowledge into urban guerrilla street warfare tactics. The gang also possessed and sold an arsenal of weapons ranging from handguns to AK-47s. The earliest recorded act of violence committed by Weddle was a 1989 assault with a firearm when at the age of 16 he pointed a shotgun at a guard while detained at a juvenile custody facility. In 1994, a 21-year-old Weddle was convicted of assaulting a law enforcement officer in San Bernardino County and was sentenced to four years in prison. He was released in 1997 after serving three years. It became obvious early on in Weddle's criminal career that he possessed a profound dislike and a vehement distaste for any type of law enforcement officers he came into contact with. In 1997, two members of the Rascals, Juan Cardiel and Pedro Sanchez, were chased through the streets of Atwater Village, allegedly by Weddle. 
Cardiel was shot in the back and paralyzed from the waist down. Sanchez took cover at a gas station, standing behind glass he thought was bulletproof. The shooter repeatedly fired through the glass door, hitting Sanchez in the back. However, he would later recover from his injuries. At the time of the shootings, both identified Weddle as the shooter. On October 14, 1997, while on parole, it is alleged that a 24-year-old Weddle committed his first homicide. Ronnie Martin, 23, was a member of Frogtown, one of TVR's biggest rivals in that water village. Martin was shot 28 times and pronounced dead at the scene. Weddle was not linked to this homicide until years later. After an unrelated charge violated his parole, Weddle was sent back to prison in late 1997. But he just couldn't stay out of prison. After violating parole in 1997, Weddle was imprisoned for roughly a year and a half. In March 1999, he was again released and lived with his grandmother in the San Gabriel Valley, which has a relatively low income rate in comparison to the more notorious neighborhoods of Los Angeles. On October 17, 1999, while on parole, a bodyguard and two rap artists were shot near the gates of Echo Sounds Music Studio in Atwater Village after concluding a recording session. The following incident was referred to as the recording studio murder. The whole recording crew had gathered on the studio's patio at 11.40 p.m. when at least two gunmen confronted them and began shooting without warning. Bodyguard Dwayne Draws Dupree, 23, was killed and pronounced dead at the scene by paramedics. Dupree was guarding rapper Ricardo Corrupt Brown, future executive vice president of Death Row Records, who was finishing his album, The Streets is a Mother, with Antro Records. Corrupt's producer, Delmar Daz Dillinger Arnaud, also with Death Row Records, and also cousin of legendary rapper Calvin Snoop Dogg Brodus, was present but uninjured. Death Row artist Javon the Realist Jones was wounded in the foot, and Willard, act of fool givers, was wounded in the calf. It was initially suggested that a hidden track on the album could be a motive for the shooting that insulted rappers DMX, The Firm, and others. Later, it was Weddle and an affiliate who were linked to the shooting. On June 3, 2000, rival gang member Ryan Gonzalez, 16, was killed as he walked home from a party. He was fatally shot in the 3300 block of Silver Lake Boulevard in Toonerville Gang Territory near Atwater Avenue Elementary School. A 27-year-old Weddle was the alleged assailant. Gonzalez was a member of the Rascals gang and he happened to share Weddle's nickname, Weddle. Investigators believe Weddle's motive was simply that the neighborhood wasn't big enough for two people with the same street name. In June 2000, an arrest warrant was issued for Weddle in connection with the Gonzalez murder, but it was several years until law enforcement caught up with him. On June 4, 2000, LAPD officers Thomas Baker and Carlos Langerica were on patrol when they received a call around 3.30 a.m. that three males had stolen a wallet and fled the scene of the robbery in a gray Honda. Upon encountering the vehicle traveling in the opposite direction, the officers made a U-turn and attempted to stop the vehicle. The driver refused to stop and accelerated, both officers noting that they were headed into the heart of the Toonerville gang territory in Outwater Village. Baker and Langerica were aware that other LAPD officers had been ambushed in this area by gang members who would block the street with debris and open fire on police vehicles. During this pursuit, a 27-year-old Weddle was allegedly using a police radio scanner to track the progress of the chase while coordinating an ambush. During the pursuit, the officers dodged a washing machine blocking the road made a right turn at the corner of Bemis Street and Brunswick Avenue and ran over a bicycle pushed in their path by an unknown suspect. As the police vehicle swerved, two gang members opened fire, ramming the rear of their vehicle to bring it to a stop. The passenger in the front seat fled the scene, pointing a semi-automatic pistol at the police. Baker rammed the vehicle again, at which point the passenger in the back seat displayed an Uzi-style submachine gun. 
Officers ran for cover behind a tree, exchanging gunfire with the remaining two suspects in the vehicle. Eventually, backed by other LAPD officers, all three robbery suspects were arrested and charged with attempted murder. Mario Little Boy Ailman, Ramon Chubbs Maldonado, and Joseph Little Respect Agazade were sentenced to two consecutive life terms. The two gang members who fired on police during the attempted ambush, one of whom is suspected of being Weddle, were never identified. Ailman, Maldonado, and Agazade refused to give up the shooter's names in exchange for a lessened prison sentence. You gotta respect that. His boys held their mud despite the fact that they were offered a reduction of time. Neither officer was injured, but both later indicated that they did not think that they would have survived the incident. Both officers were awarded the prestigious LAPD Medal of Valor in 2003 for their bravery. Weddle was eventually convicted on two counts of attempted murder in relation to these incidents. On September 14, 2000, John Marshall High School student Marty Gregory Royball was fatally shot as he sketched a picture of the Los Angeles River. A homeless man, David Lamont Martin, 33, was also shot and killed at the scene, likely a witness to the shooting. A 27-year-old Weddle was suspected in both murders. Weddle had been incarcerated for yet another parole violation involving narcotics, this time at the California Institution for Men in Chino, California, but was released in May of 2001. Beginning in June, he was suspected of shooting nine individuals in the span of five months, leaving six dead and three wounded. The homicidal spree began on June 11, 2001, when Weddle was allegedly traveling through the affluent Los Feliz area that borders Atwater Village and features the popular Griffith Observatory. Manuel Apodaca Jr., 21, lived 35 miles to the east in Pomona and was passing through with his pregnant girlfriend Nina Guerrero. Weddle allegedly opened fire on their vehicle on Los Feliz Boulevard near Interstate 5, known in that area as the Golden State Freeway. Apodaca, allegedly a member of the Rascals, was killed and Guerrero suffered severe brain damage but their unborn baby was delivered successfully. Atwater Village resident Cherry Wisotsky, 46, had reported to police that Weddle was dealing drugs out of his sister's house nearby, allegedly. On August 8, 2001, Wisotsky was murdered, as well as witnesses to the crime Marianne Wisotsky, 64, Cherry's mother, and Brian Robinson, 38, friend and neighbor. The one thing Weddle obviously despised and hated with the passion was rats. He showed no mercy to anyone who he assumed was a snitch or a rat. If he thought you were telling or would tell, he wouldn't hesitate to put a bullet in your head. Weddle was the alleged trigger man in the triple homicide involving Wisotsky. On November 8, 2001, Weddle was allegedly prowling the streets with fellow gang member Eduardo Limpy Rodriguez seeking revenge over the death of a comrade hours earlier. That night, he was literally headhunting and out for blood. Armed with handguns and assault rifles, they came upon rival gang member Dwayne Natividad in the 3100 block of Hollydale Drive, a mere six blocks south of the Gonzalez murder in 2001. Natividad was driving his Mitsubishi Montero with his girlfriend, Marjorie Mendoza, and her friend Erica Ree, 16. Mendoza and Natividad had three children, Mark 5, Justin 3, and Nathan 1, who were not with them at the time. At 12.01 a.m. November 9th, as Natividad pulled up to a residence, Weddle and Lippy allegedly pulled in front of them, exited their vehicle, and opened fire on the Montero without warning or any verbal altercation. Natividad ducked and was struck in the right hand while Ree ducked in the back seat avoiding injury. As her boyfriend threw the car in reverse and accelerated away, Mendoza was hit multiple times and was driven to Glendale Memorial Hospital, where she later died. Toonerville gang member Eduardo Limpy Rodriguez, 22, was arrested the following day. Homicide detectives announced on November 27, 2001, that another suspect, Timothy McGee, was still at large and a warrant had been issued for his arrest. Detective Timothy Neal noted that since Weddle's release from prison six months before, violent crimes in the Atwater area have skyrocketed. 
Christina Duran, 29, a friend of Weddle's, learned of Marjorie Mendoza's murder after Weddle solicited her help that same day. He needed to retrieve his girlfriend's cell phone he had dropped at the scene of the Mendoza murder. Duran was unsuccessful in finding the cell phone, but police managed to locate it and used it as evidence in Weddle's eventual trial. Shortly after the murder, Duran admitted to police during a videotaped interview with LAPD homicide detectives that Weddle was involved in the death of Mendoza. She was visibly shaken during the interrogation, frequently stating her fear of retribution. She knew how Weddle handled rats. Two days after speaking with police, Christina Duran was killed in an execution-style murder on the night she celebrated her 29th birthday party, allegedly shot by Weddle five times in the right side of the head. Despite knowing Weddle and his history, Christina still crossed Weddle, and this cost her her life. Weddle actually wrote hip-hop lyrics as a hobby, but never seriously pursued music. Many of his lyrics referred to his love of killing and his hatred of the police. Tupac was one of his favorite artists and is the one who inspired his own writing. But Weddle's aspiration for writing lyrics also became one of his biggest downfalls. Like a lot of other gang members, he liked to brag and boast about some of his own personal achievements. Against his better judgment, he detailed the Mendoza murder as well as previous homicides. One line eventually used against him in court read, Witness protection won't work. Realize your rat won't make it to the stand referring to his goal to eliminate anyone who might testify against him. He knew this was a mistake because he actually took the time to write everything in this book is a work of fiction inside his spiral notebook in case it was ever seized by police. This did not deter the prosecution in his eventual trial. In the fall of 2002, a task force of as many as 60 local and federal investigators began searching for Weddle after linking him to numerous homicides. LAPD detectives had enough evidence to charge him in a single case, the homicide of Margie Mendoza. On August 28, the LAPD appealed to the public for information regarding Weddle's involvement in the Mendoza murder as well as the triple homicide involving Cherry Wasatsky. A $55,000 reward was offered, but no one came forward. When it became clear that Weddle was running the Tunerville gang from out of state, the U.S. Marshals Service aided the LAPD in forming a task force with more investigators, vehicles, and even an aircraft. Weddle was placed on the U.S. Marshals' 15 most wanted fugitives list on September 25, 2002, wanted for questioning in an additional 11 homicides. At this point, Weddle had been officially charged only with the Mendoza murder by the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, while U.S. Marshals had charged him with the federal offense of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. City Councilman Eric Garcetti posted a $50,000 reward for Weddle's capture. Even the popular television series America's Most Wanted appealed to the public by filming a segment in early 2003 dedicated to the search for Weddle. Despite such a record for violence, Weddle had received surprisingly little attention from the national media at this point, with barely any coverage in Southern California. In 2002, there would only have been 11 individuals alive in the United States who had committed more than 12 homicides. As Los Angeles Times reporter Jack Leonard put it many years later, even in the city with more than 150 gang slayings a year, Timothy Joseph McGee's murder stood out. But not in 2003. The public hadn't heard much, but detectives knew Weddle's name well. Suspicious of the grand scope of Weddle's power and influence in the criminal world, they had difficulty linking him to his crimes because neighborhood residents, fellow gang members, and even rivals wouldn't talk to police, terrified of retaliation. Everyone knew that snitches got stitches. On January 10, 2003, the Los Angeles Times reported that a 29-year-old Weddle was wanted for his role in a dozen homicides. Perhaps it was the notoriety that drove Weddle to flee the state of California. He had already spent the last six months shifting between Atwater Village, Las Vegas, and Arizona, never staying in one place for more than a week. He would even throw off the police by brazenly staying in rival gang neighborhoods. 
LAPD officer Andy Teague was quoted as saying, People know you don't cross McGee. If you cross him, you're dead. A break in the case came when a reader of the Mojave Desert News recognized 29-year-old Weddle from a photograph in the newspaper as a man living in Bullhead City, Arizona. Weddle's father happened to own a business there, making the lead credible. The witness led authorities to a Ramar Street apartment on February 11, 2003, where Weddle lived off and on for the past year. On February 11, 2003, a surveillance team in Bullhead City observed a man resembling the 29-year-old fugitive leaving the apartment in question, but conclusive identification was not possible in the dark. The suspect was followed by investigators to a double-wide mobile home on nearby Brill Street, but no arrest was made. Early February 12th, roughly after 20 hours of surveillance, as authorities were preparing a search warrant and planning to raid the home with a SWAT team, U.S. Marshals positively identified Weddle departing the residence with a female driver. Officers pulled the vehicle over around 1 p.m. on Roadrunner Drive and Weddle was ordered out of the car and onto the ground in the presence of more than 25 officers of LAPD, Bullhead City Police Department, and federal law enforcement. Weddle surrendered without a struggle, refusing to speak. When an LAPD officer who knew Weddle attempted to engage him in conversation, Weddle simply glared at him, smiling at the spectators. The officer continued to try to talk to Weddle until Weddle finally looked at him, gritted his teeth and said, Stop trying to talk to me like we're fucking cool, you fucking cop. At the time of his arrest, Weddle was wearing a t-shirt that read, Run, jump, throw a donut referring to the best way to elude a police officer. Another t-shirt was discovered in Weddle's possession that read, Fugitive, can't see me, exemplifying his sheer audacity. The female driver was unaware of Weddle's true identity, nor did she have any suspicion that he was a wanted man. On February 13th, Weddle appeared at the Mojave County Courthouse in Kingman, Arizona to begin extradition proceedings. On February 15, 2003, Season 16, Episode 16 of America's Most Wanted aired after the fact. Weddle's story was outlined as well as the high-profile case of Elizabeth Smart, who had been missing for 256 days at that point. The episode led to her rescue 25 days later and the arrest of her piece-of-shit kidnapper, Brian Davis Mitchell. With Weddle in custody, the next logical choice for head of the Tunerville gang was Juan Sharpie Rodarte, a close associate of Weddle's. However, Rodarte was arrested later in 2003 for possession of a firearm and cocaine. While awaiting trial, Weddle was held without bail in the Los Angeles County Men's Jail, the largest single jail facility in the world, just minutes south of Atwater Village. Being the charismatic leader that he was, he commanded the respect of equally intimidating criminals housed in cell block 3300 A roll, the highest security area of the facility. Weddle was the shot caller and fellow inmates would not act without his permission. He claimed to have been verbally and physically assaulted by deputies during his time in the jail, even reporting one incident to the ACLU. Of course, it was all a ploy but it was his way of making a war call and to rally the troops. And it worked. On January 7, 2005, at roughly 4.40 p.m., inmate Rodolfo Gonzalez, intoxicated from a homemade alcoholic concoction, was to be removed from cell block A. Sheriff Deputy Raul Ibarra handcuffed Gonzalez and extracted him from his cell under the ruse of meeting with his attorney. They passed Weddle's cell who stated that Gonzalez, an acquaintance of his since elementary school, did not have his permission to leave. Obediently, Gonzalez attempted to return to his cell, fearing something was amiss as he did not have an attorney. Upon changing direction, Gonzalez was tackled by four deputies. Inciting Weddle's rage, he commanded inmates to assault the deputies with apples, oranges, urine, and bleach. These guys weren't members of his Tunerville gang, but they were still Sureños. And as their leader, he wasn't gonna let officers get away with this. In his mind, he had to set an example. 
It took 20 minutes to successfully remove Gonzalez from the cell block. Weddle then ordered inmates to break the sinks in their cells so jagged pieces of porcelain could be used as weapons. While the sinks were being broken, Weddle had all the Sureños in 3300 cell block a row continue to yell out a loud cadence in unison, Puro asesinos, puro su trece. The cadence was loud and can be heard all over in other parts of the jail. And the deputies knew that they had to hurry to stop it because the negative energy was beginning to spread to other blocks and other housing units within the jail. It was hours later, nearly 10 p.m. that evening, when two deputies began their shift and investigated the damage in a row. As they entered, they were assaulted with books, fruit, porcelain, and various items. Inmates set multiple fires and a riot squad was assembled to quash the rebellion. By 2 a.m. the following morning, all inmates had been removed from a row, mostly voluntarily, surrendering, but Weddle, always leading by example, was dragged out by force. Addressing the fact that an officer he assaulted survived the attack, Weddle was quoted as saying, next time I'll have to stab that motherfucker. On September 27, 2007, four and a half years after his capture, Weddle went on trial for the murders of Ronnie Martin, Ryan Gonzalez, and Marjorie Mendoza. Additionally, he was charged with the attempted murder of six individuals, including LAPD officer Thomas Baker and Carlos Langerica, Dwayne Natividad, Erica Ree, Pedro Sanchez, and Juan Cardio. Prosecutors initially charged the gang member with nine murders, but dropped six charges before the trial began, citing multiple unreliable witnesses. Weddle was defended by attorneys H. Clay Jack II and Franklin Peters Jr., attorneys with a combined 56 years practice. Superior Court Judge Robert J. Perry presided over the case. Perry has overseen several high-profile cases in Los Angeles, sentencing arsonist John Leonard Orr to life in prison in 1998 and dismissing conspiracy charges against Howard K. Stern in 2011 regarding the death of model Anna Nicole Smith. In court, police and prosecutors described Weddle as a thrill killer, among one of the most feared gang members in Los Angeles. A chilling portrayal of the life of a gang member was presented with testimony of cold-blooded murder, casually implemented to protect the organization's lucrative illegal drug business. Deputy District Attorney Hoon Chun stated that unlike most gang members who kill for revenge, Weddle seemed to kill for sport, much like a serial killer. Evidence was presented that Weddle taunted at least one of his victims saying, die like a man, punk, before firing the fatal shot into his skull. While prosecutors detailed the horrific crimes Weddle was accused of perpetrating, he frequently flashed a broad smile at spectators in the courtroom. At times he even slept during the trial and had to be shaken awake by his attorneys because jurors complained they couldn't hear over his snoring. <laughs> Despite his notorious reputation, the prosecution was able to solicit the testimony of Weddle's rivals, former gang affiliates, and even his accomplices. Several of these witnesses were under police protection for their safety, while others had to be ordered to testify. However, intimidated by the mere presence of Weddle in court, a number of rival gang members changed their testimonies. Cardiel and Sanchez now claim they weren't sure who shot them a decade earlier. Even prosecutors, his own attorneys, and gang experts declined comment outside court. When Weddle's incriminating hip-hop lyrics were used against him in court, in which he detailed a number of his murders, he actually bobbed his head and sung along with the lyrics. He compared himself to fictional serial killer Freddy Krueger from the motion picture series A Nightmare on Elm Street and outlaw Jesse James, not because of the notoriety, but because these two characters were relentless when it came to killing. Residents of Atwater Village were terrified of the possibility that Weddle could be found innocent and subsequently released to terrorize the neighborhood again. Police had noted that crime escalated in the area during spans when Weddle was not in custody. Meanwhile, Weddle's mother canvassed the neighborhood during his incarceration passing out leaflets that asked for prayer for her son. 
Early on in the deliberation process, a juror who favored the defense was removed for unspecified reasons and replaced by an alternate. On October 25, 2007, after a week of deliberations, eight men and four women found Weddle guilty of all three murders. He was also found guilty in the attempted murder of four other individuals, including two LAPD officers whose ambush he organized, Dwayne Natividad, Erica Reed, who were shot in the Atwater Village. Weddle was acquitted of the attempted murders of Pedro Sanchez and Juan Cardiel, both of whom identified Weddle the night that they were shot, only to claim in court that they could not recall the perpetrator. On October 26, 2007, the death penalty phase of the trial began. Weddle was eligible for the death penalty because he was convicted of multiple murders and used homicide to further the activities of a criminal street gang. Prosecutors presented additional evidence that Weddle was involved in a fourth murder, that of Christina Duran. Weddle was not tried for her murder after so many witnesses refused to testify against him. On November 9, 2007, after days of deliberating, the same jury that convicted Weddle deadlocked on whether he should be executed or receive life in prison without parole. After three days of deliberations, the vote remained 10 to 2 in favor of the death penalty, so prosecutors elected to retry the penalty phase of the case. On November 14, 2007, Weddle stood trial for the 2005 prison riot. He was sentenced to 75 years to life after being found guilty of conspiracy to commit an assault, conspiracy to commit vandalism, three counts of resisting executive officers in the performance of their duties, and two counts of assault. On August 27, 2008, with six sheriffs standing guard and the accused sitting shackled in an orange jumpsuit, a second jury agreed unanimously that 35-year-old Weddle should be sentenced to death. A fatal shooting on October 8, 2008, in which a Toonerville gang member killed a Mongols motorcycle gang member on the Los Angeles interstate initiated a probe into gang activity and the prosecution of 20 Toonerville gang members. On January 9, 2009, Judge Perry sentenced Weddle to death. Weddle was additionally sentenced to multiple consecutive life sentences for the four attempted murders. Perry stated that Weddle treated killing as some kind of perverse sport, as if he was hunting human game. He continued, Weddle is a committed killer and an obvious danger to society. Weddle now resides on death row in San Quentin State Prison awaiting execution as prisoner number G47302. Weddle was currently housed in East Block with the rest of the condemned general population inmates. When he first arrived in San Quentin, he was housed in the Adjustment Center, where most of the active Mexican Mafia members are housed. Brothers Ronnie and Hector Ayala, both Mexican Mafia leaders, were some of the first inmates that he ran into out in the walk-alone cages. And for his sake, maybe that was the best thing for him, because if he had any ideas of being a leader on death row, they definitely cleared that up and made it clear that they were the only leaders and that he was going to have to fall in line with all the other Sureños. Weddle was always used to being a leader, but death row is another world that plays by a different set of rules. We hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. Be watching for the next episode of another never before seen video of a former Mexican Mafia member from National City as he discusses his experiences and how Raul Weddle Sherm Leon not only recruited him but also became his mentor. After that, we also have another never-before-seen exclusive video of Peter Sana Ojeda getting into a car with an FBI informant. The informant has video and audio surveillance equipment set up in his vehicle so the entire conversation can be seen. In this video, they talk about Brownside and Townsend being in violation of the no drive-by policy, and as a result, Sana puts a green light on Brownside. I know Sana is old news, but this is a good video and I'm sure you guys are going to still like it.